Hello everybody, welcome to another episode of Non-Scripted Ramblings. I'm Mackendall Richardson and today we are going to be discussing Star Wars Episode 6 Return of the Jedi. Now, when I was watching this movie yesterday in preparation for this video, I had a realization that I I may have mentioned earlier, maybe in a, when we were discussing A New Hope, that um, I thought Return of the Jedi was the first Star Wars film I saw and now I can confirm it because I was watching it and I'm like no this is definitely the first Star Wars film I ever saw for sure uh, without a doubt I remember it the most uh, the, I, the earliest memories I can stretch back in my mind of Star Wars are of Return of the Jedi which you know it's just strange because yeah it's it's the third um, film in the original trilogy like I really sh I mean if I asked my parents why they showed me that first they probably won't remember because it was like 25 years ago like whatever doesn't matter <laughs> but it's just very curious to me um, so I've always kind of had a special place for the return of the uh, for return of the Jedi if I can speak this is gonna be a fun video um, even though a new hope is my favorite return of the Jedi yeah, obviously first Star Wars film I ever saw so it, I remember as a kid not having trouble understanding some of the aspects of the story like you know why was Han Solo frozen in carbonite who was Lando Calrissian um, what else I don't know uh, like the deal with Yoda and Obi-Wan and yeah heaps of stuff I remember going what's going on and just like going with it eventually I you know watched a new hope and then empire and then everything fell into place <sighs> but yes uh never nevertheless i do really really love this movie i really like it a lot i <laughs> i don't know i really i really think it's my childhood nostalgia that's getting in the way with the original trilogy for me um <laughs> Because like, you know, everyone's like, Empire, 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 and I said last week that I, you know, I know it's a really good movie, and I really like it now as an adult, but I hated it as a kid. <laughs> and, and yeah, and Return of the Jedi, for some reason, I just enjoy it more, and I just, I feel like that's just got something to do with the, the childhood nostalgia of it all. Um, so, you know, don't at me about that. Um, but I just really, I really like it. I, I think it's a lot of fun. I love the stuff um, on Tatooine at the start of the movie, getting to finally see Jabba's palace, you know, because in, in A New Hope, way back in 77, when it was just Star Wars, the, I'm fairly certain, I mean, comment below if I'm wrong, but I'm fairly certain the um, scene with Han and Jabba was added in later they filmed it at the time but it was a deleted scene but then it was added in with the special edition in 97 um so in this context in 1983 this was the first time we were actually getting to see what Jabba the Hutt looked like um so that was pretty cool uh Jabba the Hutt is a great villain uh one of the classics of course um I was reading up some trivia about him it took uh, six people to make him work this big giant slug puppet um, it took three months to build him it, he weighed 2,000 pounds and he was worth $500,000 that is not cheap um, not small scale so yeah so that's that's job of that um, I think he's awesome I do yeah I do really love the whole you know, and then it's it's kind of like a, you know, they, they kind of designed it, his palace, you know, as a reflection back to um, Mos Eisley uh, a little bit. So I really like, I really like that. Um, now, the <laughs> another thing was obviously the special edition added in was the extended kind of band performance scene. Um, that was then interspliced with the original scene where the um, you know the slave girl gets killed by the rancor. Um, that oh, I mean, sure, it was fine at the time, but like I've, I'm watching it now and I'm just like, we don't need this. <laughs> we don't. 
it was fine the way it was. I mean, they changed the music, um, they made it something a bit more upbeat. That's cool, fine, have fun with it, whatever. And, you know, they added in two CGI characters. Um, you know, one of them was the singer. And I just, God, I, I, don't, I don't like it, but that's, that's just my opinion. It's not necessary. I mean, it's cool and it, George Lucas is like, hey, look at me, I'm using CGI, but it just is a bit gratuitous. Uh, doesn't add anything to the story <laughs> or the scene even like it was fine the way it was um, cool bit of trivia though um, the actress uh, Femi Taylor who played the slave girl who gets eaten by the rancor she ended up re reprising her role so in the, the reshoots for that scene um, with the added effects and everything it's a com it's a compilation of new and old footage right but all the new footage that features her was filmed then um, when they re redid it and because uh, apparently uh, according to the IMDB trivia um, she was in even better shape in 97 than she was in 83 um, or I should say maybe 90 82 instead of 83 because it would have been filmed in 82 um, I think or maybe 83 anyway not important Regardless, she was in both, and therefore she's actually the only actress to um, reprise her role for the any of the special edition um, upgrades in 97. So that's pretty cool, I thought. Uh, what else can I talk about? Oh yes, speaking of the special effects and changing stuff, the new Sarlacc pit. Don't like it. Never have, never will. The original one was terrifying to me as a kid, just looking at this gigantic pit in this, you know, the middle of this desert that just has like rims of teeth and endless, 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 endless teeth. And, you know, and then when you're near it, it just happens to shoot out tentacles at you and tries to pull you in. Like, that's cool. That's freaky as hell. Like, leave, leave it like that. Like, why change it? But for some reason, George Lucas is like, no, we're going to do this. We're going to, we're going to give it a mouth and a, like a head and extra tentacles going everywhere like sure again not necessary doesn't add anything doesn't make the um the sarlacc uh more or less terrifying i think i think it was fine as it was but that's just me that's just me uh <laughs> yeah what else can i talk about yeah i mean that's where we you know as soon as we find out who jabba the hutt is we lose him he gets killed by leia and leia is badass in this movie, just FYI. But I might get to that later. Um, also, Boba Fett hilariously dies. Um, which was, you know, I mean, I think George Lucas didn't actually realize how popular Boba Fett was. So he's, I think he said he would have given him a grander death instead of that kind of flippant one um, if, uh, if he'd known. Because it's just so funny. I just, it makes me laugh every time because. Like, Chewie's like talking to Han, and because Han can't see you because of the hibernation sickness, and, and the, just the way Harrison Ford is like, Boba Fett, Boba Fett, where? And then just like, you know, knocks, turns around, knocks him off the, the barge there. Um, I just, it makes me laugh. It's, I think it's, it's really funny. <sighs> Good stuff. Um, what else can I talk about? Yeah, okay, yeah. Rip Yoda as well. A lot of main characters um, part ways with us in this film. And yeah, Yoda is another big one. Um, really kind of poignant, sort of sad final scene he has with Luke because Luke's kept his promise. He's gone back to Dagobah to finish his training and become a Jedi. And, and Yoda just tells him, look, you're, you're ready. Um, you just need to confront your father. Um, and Luke admits that he didn't want like he doesn't want to he doesn't want to have to kill him you know and Yoda's just like well I guess you're never gonna be a Jedi then um, <laughs> peace I'm out um, basically uh, but it's it's sad it's sad to watch him because he's trying he's trying so hard to stay alive and to keep talking to him and to keep telling him things and you know which is so interesting because of you know the whole force ghost concept but I guess that you know they can't always I guess project themselves 
when they want, otherwise like Obi-Wan would always be with Luke, I guess, so it kind of takes away the meaning of their deaths. Um, but um, but yeah, it's just, it just it's very sad to watch Yoda try and get out his last words, and every time he starts, almost, I think like four out of the five of the last sentences he says, he starts it with Luke, like he, every single one. He would just say Luke, Luke, constantly. Um, and then when he tells him at the end that there's another Skywalker and, oh, yeah. And then he, he dies, he feels. Um, it's sad, it's sad, but it's okay. He's a force ghost at the end of the movie, so that's fun. It's good. Um, yeah, what else can I talk about? Uh, okay, I'm going to talk about Ewoks then. I'm going to go talk about Ewoks. Now, I know a lot of people don't like Ewoks. I think they're cool. I don't think they're as bad as everyone says they are, to be honest. Um, they're super cute and a lot of fun and just, you know, a really, a really cool kind of expansion on the, the Star Wars universe, I think. I don't know, I just... Just and the way that they, you know, they help, um, you know, they help the rebels to, you know, um, blow up the the shield generator. Like that whole the whole battle scene on on Endor is awesome, and it's heaps of fun to watch. And you know, there's even that little scene where one of the Ewoks gets killed, and it's and his friends like mourning him, and it's so sad, and it makes me gets me emotional. But uh, yeah, and I love the fact that Chewie teams up with them to, you know get inside the ATST and take that over and yeah it's just the whole I love them they're awesome I don't get why people you know I guess it's probably because we hadn't met the Gungans yet but that's next week's movie <laughs> um oh, I'm not gonna I'll talk about that later uh but anyway uh no I I think I think they're great I think they're awesome uh originally though they were supposed to be Wookiees so in one of the earlier versions of the script, Ewoks didn't exist and George Lucas wanted the whole planet, uh, well, the moon of Endor to um, be Wookiees. And that would have been really, really cool. I don't know why they didn't do that. Um, what else can I say about the Ewoks? I think I had something else to say, but I, I've lost my note. Um, <coughs> I haven't seen, just as a side note, I haven't actually seen the two Ewok movies. And I've been told I probably don't want to. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I mean, I'm sure they're fine. They're not like, I mean, I guess they're canon, but um, yeah, I don't know if they were like made for TV movies or, or something, but the first one was the Ewok Adventure that came out in 1984, and then the second one was Ewoks The Battle for Endor came out in 1985. Um, yeah, so I don't, I don't really know anything about them so if someone can tell me where I can find them and watch them um, get thoughts and opinions maybe I'll do a review um, for you guys on them so that would be really really cool um, but yes Ewoks big yay from me that's a big yay from me uh, oh I also love <laughs> the fact that they think C-3PO is their god or a god <coughs> which results in one of my favorite like bits of sass from Han Solo ever um, like when you know they're being they're being captured and then and Han's like oh well, no C-3PO is like they seem to believe that I'm some sort of god and then Han's like well, why don't you use your divine influence and get us out of this <laughs> and 3 is like I'm sorry sir that just wouldn't be proper proper <laughs> it's against my protocols to impersonate a deity <laughs> I just love it. I love it. I don't know for some reason that scene has always made me laugh. Just like how pissed off Han is. And I'm pretty sure there's like a really good screen cap of that scene where he makes this beautiful face. That's like it's become a meme online. I'm pretty sure, but uh, it makes me laugh. Um, oh man, Han Solo again in this movie. Harrison Ford, fantastic. Um, I think I prefer his performance, like performances in the first couple of films which it makes sense because you know he wasn't really wanting to be in this movie they like you know it's very famously known that Harrison Ford wanted to be killed off um, and get out of this franchise for 
for some reason, I don't know, I still don't know why, or I don't understand why, but that's his prerogative. Uh, he got his wish and made me cry for days and days and days, so thank you so much. I still love you, so it's okay. But regardless, um, I feel like that might explain why he's a little, I, I just watching it, I was just like, is he phoning it in a little bit? Like, I didn't really buy a lot of his, his performance in this movie, but nevertheless, the sass was still there, and he still had a lot of, like, my favorite lines that I, you know, some of the ones I just said, and, um, you know, when they're on Tatooine, and, and Luke's telling him, he's like, I was born here. And Han's just like, you're gonna die here, you know? Convenient. <laughs> it's great. And um, or when they're on, when they're on Endor, and Han's like, I don't know, I think he's like, him and Chewie are like hatching a plot to, you know, grab something or get something. I've forgotten off the top of my head now, sorry what it was. But um, Luke says to him, quietly there may be more of them out there and then Han just turns around and goes hey it's me <laughs> just oh just bless you Harrison Ford your comedic timing is gold love it absolutely love it um okay but yeah I think the big big things that come in this movie uh obviously this is the first time we see the Emperor um like actually live not just a hologram as we did in Empire Strikes Back um one of the actors who portrayed him in Empire, Clive Revel, was actually not even asked to reprise his role for some reason. Uh, I'm not really sure why. I mean, that probably has to do with, I guess, the fact that the physical form of the Emperor was um, the uh, female actress, Marjorie Eaton, um, with, you know, prosthetics and all that. So maybe that's why he wasn't even asked. But, like, not even he wasn't even approached to dub his voice. Um, because they were obviously looking for a physical presence to play the Emperor. Um, and yeah, Ian McDiarmid eventually um, landed the role. He wasn't, he was the second choice uh, for the part. And uh, he was just supposed to be the, the physical form of the Emperor, uh, you know, as we see in the movie. But then he was like, well, no, I would like to, you know, give the voice a shot as well. And then he, um, he, he did, and George Lucas and Steven Spielberg were so impressed, they were like, yep, well, you're the Emperor now, that's, that is that. Uh, and, you know, he's synonymous with the character, he's most known for the character, obviously. And, I mean, yes, Jabba the Hutt's one of the greatest villains of all time, but the Emperor is next level, something else. And Ian McDiarmid's performance is chilling, and unnerving and villainous, e just pure evil, pure dark side. He's just excellent, absolutely excellent. Um, every single scene he's in, he steals it. The way he delivers his lines, the laugh that he gave this character is just so sinister. Like, it's everything about him is just phenomenal. He's probably the best thing in the film. Um, one of the best things in the film, at least, and I just, I adore his portrayal. Um, it's funny because the Emperor actually, when, when Luke, George Lucas originally was going to continue beyond episode 6, um, so the episode 7, 8, and 9 were supposed to be a trilogy that would follow um, Luke's sister Nelith, if you remember me mentioning her last week, so not Leia, Nelith, uh, and you know, Return of the Jedi was going to originally end with Luke going off to, you know, try and find her where she is. Is she trained to be a Jedi? What's become of her? And the Emperor originally was supposed to be the v villain in episode 9. And lo and behold, <laughs> here we are, uh, you know, 35 some years later and episode 9 is about to come out and look who's coming back the Emperor like come on I it's brilliant it's obviously done on purpose and I just I just thought that was really cool when I read that I'm like oh he's still gonna be the villain of number nine look at that <laughs> nothing's changed um, but yeah the original seven eight nine got scrapped because uh, Lucas put himself through hell on episode five, it really seems that way. And it ended up in, you know, he, he's 
him and his wife got divorced and he fell out with one of his good friends, Gary Kurtz, um, the producer, uh, because the film went over schedule and ran over budget and it was just a big, big, big mess. So um, because of all that strain, Lucas just decided, hey, I'm just going to bring this in a bit, finish off the trilogy now and just be done with it. Um, so he had no plans at that time to continue with 7, 8, 9. Um, which is why eventually he ended up just going back and doing 1, 2, and 3, which he had already decided then, back in, what, the late 70s, or early 80s, um, that it was gonna follow Obi-Wan and, obviously, the fall of Anakin. So, that, as we know, came to pass. Uh, but yeah, so he just decided to get rid of Nellith altogether uh, and make Leia... Um, yeah, make Leia uh, Luke's sister instead. So, and that's, that resolved that, that resolved the, you know, supposed love triangle <laughs> um, that was going on. I can't even call it a love triangle now that I know that they're brother and sister, but obviously at the time before that was revealed, that would have been a thing. So, but it's, it's still strange to me. Nevertheless, it's okay. Um, what else? Okay, well, speaking of the fall of Anakin, so, obviously Darth Vader redeems himself at the end of the film and, and kills the Emperor <coughs> whilst the Emperor is trying to kill Luke. And it's, it's a very powerful scene because, you know, Luke very well nearly dies. Um, and it's very, yeah, it's very intense. I remember being very frightened by the Emperor when I was a kid, not just for how creepy it was, but this right at the end when he uses his lightning powers, um, lightning force powers to try and kill Luke is just really intense. And then, yeah, Vader comes around, kills the Emperor, and then unfortunately get, you know, gets killed in the process. And it's, yeah, it's very sad. I always remember being really sad, saddened by that because I'm like, well, he finally came good and now he's dead and it's just... Like, why not come back to life? Why, why the hell not? But anyway, that's, that's that. Um, but we finally got to actually see him as like face on, uh, what he looked like under the mask. And that was a pretty cool reveal. Uh, Sebastian Shaw played the live action, uh, in the flesh, as it were, um, Anakin Skywalker in both the unmasking scene and the, the original Force Ghost scene from 1983. He had no idea what he was doing when he rocked up to set um, and yeah, ended up finding that out. And poor David Prowse also had no idea that he wasn't actually going to be playing, <coughs> like legitimately playing Darth Vader um, unmasked, playing Anakin Skywalker, Walker. so he was, I'm pretty sure he was pretty pissed, which I can understand. Uh, but yeah, so Sebastian Shaw gives a lovely little brief performance um, in a scene with Luke as he's dying and it's really, it's a really nice scene and it's a really good end for his character. He's, the first couple of films he's very much the villain, obviously, and he still is the villain in number three, but he, you know, as soon as the, the twist of his, Luke's father is revealed, he, he's very much humanised and it's kind of hard to hate him. Um, like I find watching Return of the Jedi just, I'm rooting for him the whole time. Like I really, I don't hate him. I don't, you know, think any less of him. I just like, oh my God, there's a, you know, there's a good guy underneath all of that, you know. Um, I just feel bad for him. It's, <coughs> it's very strange. But I watch A New Hope even knowing all of that and I'm just like, no, nah, he is <coughs> very good villain in A New Hope. That's for sure. Um, but, of, um, yeah, as we now know, in the uh, 2004 DVD edition of Return of the Jedi, um, Hayden Christensen um, was superimposed into the film as Force Ghost Anakin. Um, this is because George Lucas decided he wanted, um, you know, the ghost to be Anakin before he turned to the dark side, which is why he doesn't look scarred or disfigured or any of that stuff. He just looks like Anakin before he turned evil. 
um, which I think is really, really sweet and, um, and beautiful, to be honest. And even though they changed the music for the, the celebration scene, which kind of pisses me off a little, only a little bit, because I remember, you know, watching Return of the Jedi on repeat when I was a kid and the original music was just so much fun and very, <coughs> very upbeat. Not that this new music isn't upbeat, but the original music was so happy and positive and, you know, but this one is very much, it's happy but it's bittersweet at the same time because, you know, it just, I don't know, for some reason it just really evokes a, a bittersweet feeling in me because of just the way Luke looks at Anakin, Obi-Wan and Yoda, their force ghosts, all standing together and, um, you know, you, you watch Anakin appear next to them and the music's going and it's kind of, it's just, I don't know, it's, it just frames it in a certain way that just makes me feel things. And I was watching it last night going, I'm like, this shouldn't really be making me emotional, but for some reason it is, because it's just like, oh, he's, he's good again, but he's also dead. And it's just really sad because, you know, he only ever had the best intentions when it came down to it, but yeah, he didn't really make some good choices as we know, and we'll find out in upcoming videos. <laughs> yeah, good. Um, so, Return of the Jedi, it won an Oscar, a Special Achievement Oscar for visual effects, which is, you know, understanding, because um, visual effects for 83 are pretty damn good in this movie. It was nominated for four awards. Um, again, my boy John Williams was nominated for Best Score, but didn't win. Uh, but that's, that's all that. Um, what else can I even say? Oh, this is a really cool uh, bit of trivia that I found out. Uh, David Fincher, one of my favourite directors of all time. Director of Fight Club, Gone Girl, Panic Room, uh, Alien 3. Yes, I will mention that because I like Alien 3. So, you know, feel free to at me on that one. Um, but no, he, he um, actually worked for ILM back in the day. And on this film, he's, he's credited as an assistant cameraman. Um, and he also worked on, I think, Temple of Doom um, as well. So I, I just thought that was really, really cool. I'm like, well, you got to start somewhere, you know? Um, yeah, so that's really awesome. Oh, Admiral Akbar, I've not even mentioned him at all. Definitely an unsung hero that should have got a better ending. Uh, in an upcoming film, but I'll get to that when I get to that. I just wanted to quickly mention that apparently in the original script, like the, one of the first drafts, his very famous you know, movie defining line, uh, it's a trap, was originally it's a trick. Just doesn't really have the same ring to it, but that's just me. So I'm glad <laughs> they changed it. Um, this was due to it not testing well with audiences. The it's a trick line. They, the audiences didn't really go for it. So good call. Good, good call. Um, just looking over my notes. I don't think... Yeah. I mean, you know, I could just quickly touch on... Oh, wait. Wait. One more thing. Alan Rickman auditioned for a role in this movie. The late, great, fantastic Alan Rickman auditioned for the role of uh, Moff Gergerod. Uh, which is um, one of the imperial, you know, higher up in the ranks guys. Right at the start of the movie, he's the one that's like nervously awaiting Vader's arrival. Um, right at the start, he's like, we shall double our efforts. That guy. It was going to be Alan Rickman. Well, should have been Alan Rickman, but I mean, that guy did a really good job. But Alan Rickman actually auditioned for that character. So that I thought was pretty cool. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, so finally in closing, before this video drags on too long, um, the scene where Leia finds out. I've always talked about this with my friends and maybe on a podcast called Fred uh, or the monthly at Winifred's, hashtag shameless plug, um, <laughs> that, you know, it's just, it's just a weird scene given what the prequels did. Um, you know, because she's always like, you know, Luke's like, Leia, do you remember your mother? And she's like, J just images, really, feelings. Like, but and then the prequels are just like, you know, Padme dies right as she gives birth, like straight away. Um, so that's always been strange for me. 
and then also Leia going somehow I've always known that they were brother and sister well then why did you kiss him twice twice in Empire Strikes Back <sighs> I don't know I don't know it's George Lucas what can we say he tries and he's given us some incredible films so I'm not gonna hold it against him but yeah I don't know also with the the mother thing I mean I could come down to the force maybe as a child she you know because obviously she's force sensitive maybe she saw her mum um, when she was a kid so like yeah somehow in her mind it's definitely possible definitely possible okay I think that's all I've got to say in Return of the Jedi uh, it's a fantastic film it's yeah I mean it's so much fun from start to finish I don't care what you say about the Ewoks I love them I love them I love them they're great they're awesome uh, but yeah yeah fantastic stuff all right cool thank you so much for watching I really really appreciate it uh, I've been a Kendall Richardson and you've just experienced non-scripted ramblings may the force be with you